Hello and welcome to a special edition of the Rural Doctors Program. I'm Jerry Gannon and today the program comes to you from Narrambeen in Western Australia. And why are we here? We're here because agriculture is Western Australia's third largest export earner and as such there is a lot of agricultural activity on. And today we're hoping to talk to you about some of the things that as doctors you'll be presented with in your surgery when things go wrong down on the farm. But before we get into today's program, a word about Rural Health West's locum program. These programs offer great opportunities and attractive incentives, including travel to remote and rural areas from the vineyards in the southwest region to the gorges in the Kimberley region. You can offset some of the cost of your travel by doing a week or two of locum work. Dr. Henson and his two Scottish Terriers, Daisy and McDougall, took off on a 600 kilometer journey with spectacular views of the Southern Ocean to a locum placement in the town of Hopeton. Dr. Henson commends his locum post by saying, for me, a change like this is as good as a holiday. So if you're a rural doctor in Western Australia and are looking for a well-deserved break, the Rural Health West team can assist in finding a qualified locum ready to service your community. For more information on how to register as a Rural General Practitioner locum in Western Australia or to request a locum, please contact the team at Rural Health West on 08 6389 4500 or email locum at ruralhealthwest.com.au. And now to today's programme and first we join Dr Peter Lyons together with med student Henry Maddock as well as Dr Olga Ward and myself as we start to look at some of the issues that crop up in rural surgeries in Western Australia. Peter and Henry, welcome to the program. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Peter, we're in the heart of sheep and wheat country here where we see a lot of chemicals being used uh, on farms. What are the sort of things that you're seeing presenting to you in surgery as a result of accidents involving such chemicals? Um, I think one of the, um, the hidden hazards of uh, modern day farming um, is the use of various uh, insecticides and, uh, and some herbicides because many of them actually contain uh, organophosphorus compounds and uh, although we all learned a long time ago about severe acute um, poisoning, uh, there is of course a much more prevalent chronic low dose um, toxicity issue um, and one of the manifestations may just be um, a sim simply a feeling of, of, of tiredness and, and lethargy. So um, it's something that we need to be conscious of and perhaps actually go looking for. Uh, a couple of years ago there was a vogue for farmers uh, who were prompted by their various uh, organisational bodies to, to come in and ask for a blood test. Um, that uh, seems to have died off a little bit. But uh, a simple blood test looking at acetylcholinesterase levels uh, can be helpful to establish whether somebody is exposing themselves to unnecessary risk. So, Peter, is it something that you would recommend that other GPs in farming areas should ask their patients to, to do? To, to yes, I think it's something you could legitimately add to the battery of, of other tests that we routinely do to monitor the, the long-term health and welfare of our rural patients. Once you've got a, um, a positive cholinesterase test that's come back saying that the patient does have a reasonably toxic sort of exposure, what would you do next? Um, I think it's up to the farmer to then identify where his uh, source of exposure has come from uh, and perhaps to take steps to try and minimise that for the future. Um, in terms of treatment, I think unless somebody had very severe physical manifestations, I think probably the best course of action is uh, um, masterly inaction and just to let the body recover slowly. Um, there are of course, you know, situations where you might want to use atropine or, or other medications, but I think they would be very exceptional. I mean, I think, you know, if, if you're concerned that somebody's got uh, a very severe level of toxicity in an acute form, then I think it's very reasonable to at least discuss that with either poisons information or one of the toxicology consultants at one of the large tertiary hospitals in Perth. Um, but for the most part, I think it would be much more a case of identify the source and uh, 
minimise future problems. And Peter, have you seen many people who, who do actually have these long-term problems, this long-term exposure? Well, to be honest, no, I haven't seen that many, but um, perhaps I'm as guilty as the farmers in that I'm perhaps not checking it as much as I, as I could. Um, I think general awareness um, should be promoted uh, and obviously I think it's up to each individual farmer to try and establish best practice. Well, on that subject, let's now meet some of those chemicals we've been talking about and a man who works with them on a daily basis, Gerald Repiccioli. Gerald, tell us about some of the chemicals that you have to handle, um, both as an agricultural operator and um, the sorts of things that our local farmers are very likely to be handling in the paddock. Well, there's, um, it's broken into three groups, but the main is uh, herbicides, yep. and uh, then you've got insecticides. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the herbicides are fairly uh, powerful, and uh, you do need to uh, have the appropriate uh, safety gear, yep. although I know 90% uh, don't. I think the younger generation are seeing the uh, the safety aspects and maybe coming to grips with uh, wearing all the protective gear and uh, also with the insecticide uh, that's um, a very touchy uh, a chemical you yep. just touch a fly or anything uh, you go to brush a fly away you touch your face uh, you get an itchy nose you go like that or something then uh, 15 minutes later you've got a bit of a irritation yep. and um, I've had it on my, as I said, getting around in shorts, and I've had it around my legs uh, or on my knees. I've been, when I'm flying, my hands are resting on my knee or something, or one is, or whatever. Does it blister? No, it no, it just, it just goes a little red that I've had trouble with, but itch, and I've just used uh, uh, sun uh, lotion. Um, when you get the sunburn, put mm. that on, and that's about all that I've managed to do. I, I've had chemical, um, the roga, the insecticide on me, and you don't realise that you've got it on you. You thought you've washed and you're clean, and 10 or 11 o'clock at night, you start shaking and carrying on. And it's been that bad that I've had, I think, three baths and uh, two baths and three showers over a period of about four hours to try and uh, see. But the chemical has already got into the uh, body. And, okay, so uh, if, you're, if you're shaking and salivating and um, feeling not too great, then obviously the stuff is systemic. Yes. Have you then had to go and have blood tests and things to, uh, to check that you haven't got a toxic dose? No, I didn't bother. Um, I didn't want to be laid up for the next day, I suppose. But um, I, um, next morning I'd slept it off and uh, I was okay. But, but that's something that we could certainly be but, suspicious of with our, yes, with our right. patients if they present with some odd symptoms because mm. they may not always make the connection with the chemical that they were exposed to, say, eight hours ago. Yeah? That's right. what, what are the, the, the possibilities here, medically speaking, of, of a prolonged exposure to rogo, for instance? When it's, when it's killing the insects, um, it produces some muscular paralysis and it can certainly do that in people but the more common things that it will do are to do with the autonomic nervous system so it's almost like having a snake venom you know you get uh, people can get either a dry mouth or sometimes excessive salivation depending on, uh, on which insecticide they've been exposed to they can get muscle cramps um, their blood pressure can plummet they can get terrible sweating and they can get shaking and weakness but more often than not what they get is a bit of skin irritation and kind of chronic low-level illness and chronic low-level abnormal liver function tests so if you get a lot of long-term very low-level exposure you'll often get some minor abnormalities that are quite difficult to pick. Gerald what about if uh, you inhale some of these chemicals? I think the uh, insecticide is the uh, one to worry about uh, that comes in a powder form and there is a powder form that's released now that it's in plastic bags and you just drop the plastic bag in there. But if you're putting a chemical in to that vat uh, in plastic, you can inhale it. But So you always work upwind of it. So what kind of safety gear do you actually have? Well, we've got the um, mask, the full section mask here. It's a, just the chemical mask. 
mm -hmm. that is applied and just unscrew the uh, fittings and uh, change the, uh, the filter from time to yep. time and um, uh, right. just and check it every season. This is used for all types of chemicals or only for powdered things? Oh, anything that's uh, very fumy or anything, mm -hmm. just use one of those. We do have those uh, paper masks um, and they are fairly helpful because uh, these just get damaged in the vehicle and cumbersome and you just get another f filter from the uh, cardboard box in the trunk. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys seem to prefer those if they are going to wear them. Mm -hmm. But uh, when it comes out very warm, they don't want to wear overalls, uh, uh, um, wet weather gear um, and um, rubber boots and stuff like that, so they scale down. And uh, so they've got to be more careful and more proficient on what they're doing. And that's, of course, where your accidents happen they can, all the yes. time with the corner cutting. Well, it's But I agree, you know, if it's 46 degrees, who's going to want to get into rubber boots and full overalls? You've got to be practical, off? don't you? You've yeah. got to be practical. Gerald, what, what other gear have you got here to we, show us? We have um, a shield. Uh, they get damaged. They're a cumbersome uh, item. You've got uh, the mask and safety glasses, and I think they're the best in a hot day. These, you get contaminated either side, and then you can't see through them. So they're good for the... Uh, for uh, the bureaucrats, I suppose, but, um, but it's they not practical. They're not practical. And then I noticed that you've got a thing down there in a urine sample container, but I'm presuming that it's not, in fact, a urine sample. No, it's a uh, eye wash. Yep. It's kept, we have them in glove boxes of all the vehicles. It's just in case uh, someone gets some splashed in their eye. Uh, it's pretty uh, powerful. The insecticide is bad for that. And uh, then we have a first aid box. And then you've got some chemical uh, got resistant overalls yes, and gloves. Yes, chemical resistant gloves. Okay. And, um, Do people use these a lot or do yeah, they skimp on these? Yeah, no, the gloves are the best. Uh, it's um, how you pour the chemical out mm -hmm. and uh, is the main uh, ingredient for safety yep. because uh, some people just don't know how to pour a 20 litre drum out. Firstly, when... Uh, you start teaching someone how to pour. They say, we know how to pour, we know how to pour. And uh, nine times out of 10, they don't. And they'll pick up the container and empty it out this way. And the, as the chemical's coming out, the air can't get in. So it will throw back and it splashes up like, I'll show you, like that. It, it tends to go out everywhere. And um, when there's a bit of expansion there, it, it just goes. If you pour it like this and do it that way, you've got a nice even pour like that. There's no splashing whatsoever. So uh, you can be safe and you don't need so much protective clothing on you. If, but it's just people have got to be taught how to pour chemical. You've got a truck with obviously a couple of big water tanks on the back. If you need to, uh, if you have a major spill, how much water is usually available, say, on the back paddock of a farm? Well, we always carry fresh, our system is that we carry fresh water here and it doesn't get contaminated, so you can drink that water. And the only time it goes is from the pump through the mixing container and it's separate. Now, we, we always have a bucket on the ground with soap suds or just even fresh water so that we could wash ourselves if the um, you get instant splash. Uh, if someone's around to help you, well, then they can get the water to you. But if you get blinded or, or something, you know where the bucket is, you can at least stagger to it. Yeah. Gerald, down here you've got some Rogor and um, first aid directions on the back. Uh, Doctor and Poisons Information Centre and one atropine tablet every five minutes. What do you actually do if you get a spill of Rogor? Well, you can't buy atropine tablets now. Yeah. Uh, they've been out off the market for maybe four or five years, I believe. And now uh, the modern trend is to use a needle. And it means that we have to carry uh, a bulky uh, batch of needles around and uh, the uh, chemical to go with it instead of just atropine um, tablets. Mm -hmm. What so how many for? farmers do you think would actually have ampules of atropine and a bundle of needles for, for administering atropine? I would say maybe maybe one out of a hundred. I would say that. Yeah. 
I know um, farmers uh, don't think they'd uh, get poisoned. If you're doing it every day like everyone is now, uh, they think they know what they're doing. And uh, you can have a hose uh, come off a pipe and um, yep. splash it, and that's when accidents do happen, when it's unforeseen. What's the worst that you've seen from other people in terms of uh, exposure to rogue? Um We did have a hose come off um, one of the um, pipes some time ago, and a fellow was covered in, um, I think, herbicide, it was and um, they took him into, or gave him a good wash down and then took him into town to uh, make sure he was okay. And uh, that lad was okay, but the first thing is to uh, have a wash down, unless you drink it, of course, you can't, but if you get splashed with it, well, just wash yourself down. What happens if you drink it, Olga? Um, you probably die. On that sobering note. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I could ask Henry, in your ex long experience as a farmer and your limited experience as a medical student, what sorts of uh, farm health problems, farmer health problems, have you seen that you think, gosh, this really is a problem for people in this country? Well, I think farming is, a, is a, I guess, an occupation where there is always going to be a lot of hazards. So whether it is um, in your work tools with the, the grinder or the welder or, or the moving parts like a, a, an auger, a PDO shaft, um, or whether it is with the exposure to the chemicals. I think there is always going to be some form of uh, risk at uh, yeah, contracting some. In your experience though, Henry, are farmers minimising these risks or are they being a bit careless about how they go about using chemicals and machinery? I would definitely say that um, they are being a bit careless if you were to look at it from a, a full safety perspective. But if you were to look at it from a practicality risk perspective, I would say they're making some sort of compromise because the, in, in, in reality, all the safety precautions are not exactly uh, going to be used by all the farmers because it's just not realistic, it's not practical. However, at the cost of their safety, yeah. Peter, what other sorts of health problems have you seen for farmers that you think um, really need addressing in this Australian context? I think probably underpinning all of the, the health issues is the uh, age-old notion uh, that many farmers still seem to exhibit, unfortunately, of she'll be right, uh, which means uh, a reluctance to acknowledge that uh, they should perhaps come and seek uh, medical uh, attention, um, if not for an acute problem, then certainly for a, a general checkup and, and, and well-being assessment. Um, and that's the biggest hurdle, I think, is actually persuading farmers that it's okay to come to the doctors and to be checked over and to talk about any issues that they might have. Once you have overcome that hurdle, of course, then the, uh, the, the chronic health issues that we all are very aware of um, are uh, particularly important out here. Uh, there's often a feeling of isolation. Uh, the economic situation with farming um, is not terribly good these days. Uh, many of them are in quite a lot of debt and they're very worried about the future. Um, so depression um, is obviously a, a, an ever-present danger. Um, often in rural country, uh, rural country towns, there's a, a, an alcohol culture, um, and because they often live a long way from the nearest pub, um, there's al always a tendency for people to drink more than they should and then get in their cars and drive home, hopefully in one piece. Um, with the increasing mechanisation on farms, there's perhaps less manpower actually needed for a lot of the day-to-day -day work. And so I think a lot of farmers are probably not as fit um, as they think they are. Um, and there's a, a, a big problem with being overweight. Um, trying to persuade farmers that just because they're 30 kilograms overweight and look identical to all the other farmers in the district, trying to persuade them that that's actually a problem um, is often an uphill task. Let's look at that problem. I mean, we're, we're in the country where there's fresh food, where there are animals running around. What is the problem with obesity here? Why, why is there such a problem? Um, I think it's perhaps um, a culture that uh, you have to, you know, make your own entertainment, and often that revolves around, you know, lots of food and lots of alcohol, um, and, and perhaps that's, that's one of the issues. 
I think um, in association with the, the rest of the country, it's just a, a tri attributed to a um, change of lifestyle mostly. So uh, you can see like a decrease in, um, in uh, exercise, physical activity in gen general terms. Um, say an uh, um, increase in the diet, um, unhealthiness, although out, out here in the country you could say that there's limited access to fast foods such as McDonald's, um, so that would be beneficial. But um, again, it's just a, yeah, that kind of uh, mindset that the, we have taken, as a, not as a country, as a country, not specifically in the... In the Peter mentioned exercise and the fact that farms are so mechanised now, there's not as much outlet for physical uh, activity. Is there a culture at all of farmers taking exercise for the sake of being healthy? Do you, is that alien to them? Well, apart from uh, some farmers who uh, take pride in their sporting activities at weekends, I would say, by and large, there isn't very much of a, an ethos about exercise for its own sake. And I would say that there's reason for that because if they were to undertake this, this like you said, um, it would be it would say go against the the economics of running their farm. Most people today are very busy, especially if they're trying to run a ten thousand acre farm single-handedly. So trying to include that in their daily routine would just be not possible. Before o'clock in the morning, start instead of exactly. Five. Yeah, that's so. So have you noticed over your relatively short life, any decrease in the amount of physical stuff that gets done on the farm? Um, I still think that farming is still a um, quite a physically active job as compared to a lot of office jobs and say uh, truck driving, but um, I haven't, I can't say that I have, no. Let's look at the depression issue which is a particular problem in agricultural areas given as you said Peter all the problems that farmers are facing. What's being done around here to try and combat that? And what's being done to try and help farmers to get on top of their, the issues that are troubling them? Well, o over and above the, the growing awareness of depression with such organisations as Beyond Blue, um, there is actually a growing movement across Australia uh, called the Men's Shed um, uh, process. And now in Australia, there are several hundred of these men's sheds dotted all over. Um, the principle is to provide a forum for like-minded men to get together um, and it's for companionship and fellowship and uh, a reason to get together and to feel comfortable in each other's company so that they can discuss matters of mutual concern to them. Uh, and it's all dressed up in the form of shed type activities which might be metalwork or woodwork. But principally it's to get together with the guys and to feel that you're not alone and that there's always somebody to talk to. But there is a tendency when blokes get together to talk about blokey stuff, when in fact, you know, blokes don't talk about the things that are really bothering them. Does the shed help them to, to share those, those stories? Well, I think it's much more likely to be a suitable venue than down the pub. Obviously, down the pub is the only other usual outlet for people to get together to talk. But of course, then there's much more of a machismo culture and, and you can't sit there weeping into your pint. So, um, given that most men's sheds take place uh, you know, during the daytime and they're usually alcohol free and it's all lubricated with lots of cups of tea, uh, I think it's going to be a much more conducive environment to do that. One of the things that I think um, has been really nice about the men's sheds that are established is just that um, chance for some of the, the older guys who have so many skills that um, perhaps some of the young lads and particularly the ones who aren't farmers who are living in town um, you know, they can share some of their skills with, uh, with wood turning or children's Met toy work. construction or... Here in Narrenbeam, we've got a, a, an up and coming, um, well, it's actually a community shed because it's got uh, a section set aside for ladies' art and, arts and crafts. But at least one farmer who's currently coming along um, has lived in the district all his life and he's probably in his late 60s and he hardly knows anyone in town. And so this is actually a great new social avenue. Now that he lives here in, in, in the town, this is his way of actually starting to meet some other people. Peter, as a, as a GP, uh, you would see farmers when they have to come to you, as opposed to when they should come to you. And I, I think that's kind of the norm. Um, you're obviously a general practitioner as opposed to, to a psychiatrist, but do you sometimes find yourself cast in the role of psychiatrist in order to get to what is the root cause of whatever is bothering him and to, and to head off any potential psychological problems that he may be under. And how difficult is it to get farmers to open up? 
I think it's enormously difficult to get them to acknowledge that perhaps there are some, some mental health issues. Um, thankfully, um, we haven't got too many um, people who are um, troubled. very severely troubled, mm. but I think there's probably quite a, a, a commonplace low level of um, you know, mild depression and anxiety. Um, I think it's often helpful to try and uh, discuss um, some of these issues uh, in, in mechanical terms, in, in terms that farmers understand. So I'm, I'm always using uh, the, the imagery of, of a ute and how you can check the suspension and the oil and the tyre pressure and the revs per minute. But sometimes if it's not working properly, there may be a problem with the electronics. Would you encourage other GPs to adopt that proactive attitude in, in, in farming areas in particular to, to look under the hood, as it were, to continue the analogy? I, I think it's very important to be proactive. I think to be a reactive doctor uh, is, is fine to a point, but there's probably going to be a lot of situations where you're not going to fully explore the issues at hand. Um, so general screening, fishing net questions about, uh, you know, how are they going and are they sleeping all right and have they got any worries? You know, I'm sure that that's often uh, just the entree that some farmers need in order to feel comfortable about beginning to open up. It's also important that although farmers don't come very often, um, it's important not to put them off on, on their first and only visit in 10 years. So to try and uh, get them to completely change their lifestyle um, on, on this occasion is perhaps counterproductive because they may then feel it, that it's all too threatening and too difficult and they're not going to come back. So um, I think it's good to gently bait them with um, one or two more acceptable health interventions like checking their blood pressure or um, talking to them about um, you know, whether they've got a problem with, uh, with their heart and um, maybe get some blood tests done at some point. And then they become more familiar with the, the process of interacting with a doctor. And then you can start intervening on, on, on other levels when they begin to know you and trust you and hopefully like you. So how do you tackle some of that lifestyle stuff, Peter, the cholesterol and the smoking and the alcohol and high blood pressure? Um, with a big smile on my face. Because there's no point getting angry or frustrated or um, lecturing scolding them, people them, because yes. that really is that's very unhelpful and, and people just uh, become very defensive um, and it's a, it's a difficult balancing act uh, and has to be tailored to to each patient I think mm -hmm. yeah. um, some Small people changes one at a time that's yes, right in an unthreatening way what about looking at the broader family of farmers including their spouses who are their partners on these farms and their children um, do, do you do you look at that to when an individual from a, a farming family comes in? How do you approach that? I often will ask about the family and, and how everyone's getting on. Um, and of course, in these small towns, it's uh, usually the case that everybody is either related to everyone else or is best friends to somebody who's related to everyone else. So there's a big network out there and everyone behaves and feels in context. So um, it's often the case that if you know that the family next doors have just had a tragedy, that this may have an impact on the patient in front of you, for right. example. Yeah. Henry, can you tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up on a farm in terms mm. of the kind of support that you had um, and uh, how your family or your community tackled some of the issues that we've been talking yes. about? Yes. Um, I definitely think um, being from a, r a local, a rural town, you have uh, limited access to things like Perth. But I think the community and the strength, the sense of community is almost stronger. And so I think that that network kind of acts to, I guess, compensate for that limited access of uh, resources. So I think um, I, I went to a small primary school of about 45 kids, but it was almost like the sense of uh, friendship was there no matter what. So um, I think that and. Um, and yeah, the sense of family and community is, is definitely stronger. Mm. There's a consolidation going on in agricultural areas, Henry, where 
farmers are retiring or leaving and the farmers being taken up by the next bigger farm around the place, which results in a, a, a dwindling population and a smaller group of people, not enough people to make up the footy team and the netball team. What sort of effect do you see that having in small country towns? Yeah, unfortunately, it's a, a bit of a sad effect, as we say. Yeah, like you said, people leaving the rural towns, being taken over by more larger farmers. I don't think if there is any uh, short-term... Um, uh, I guess solution for that but I guess the way that to really try and tackle that is to try and really promote these community events like the football like the cricket and the tennis and um, and really try and get people involved whether it's through adver advertising or just like I said a sense of community. So speaking of being on a farm let's now visit a farm Peter Hall is a farmer in Narrambeen as we find out what it's like today to be a farmer in the wheat belt and the dangers and hazards that are ever present. Peter, thanks for joining us on the programme here at, on your own spread in Narrumbi. No worries, it's a pleasure. Peter, there's lots of uh, bits of dangerous machinery on farms. Can you tell us about uh, some of the dangerous things that happen to farmers? Um, August seems to be the main thing that bite fingers or catch, um, catch you out, um, or anything with a PTO. People What's a PTO for people? Power takeoff um, yep. from the back of a tractor. We've got a PTO auger, that's um, probably one of the dangerous, most dangerous things on the farm. What are the sort of precautions you have to take around a piece of equipment like that? Um, have all your clothes tucked in, um, so nothing grabs. Uh, make sure the guards are on, um, and keep your fingers out of the things that are going round and round. What are some of the, the injuries that you've seen in your time as a farmer that have happened because of PTOs and augers? Uh, I know three people have lost fingers. Um, in an auger, um, a student lost a hand in an auger, um, a harvest auger. Um, yeah. They're serious injuries. Yeah. Why would you, why would you be looking at a, a moving auger? There's always something there that just won't go through. So farmers have got a habit of just pushing it through, not with a stick or something, but they just put their finger in and they can't see things going around. Consequently, it bites them. Good clean grain is fine because it will come out, go into the auger, or fall through. Yep. But if you have lumps that won't fit through the screen, um, some farmers tend to get something jammed in it or just push with the fingers, and as soon as your finger disappears in there, off it comes. Yeah, and I've seen a few arms go, yes. and occasional person with the, who's decided to grow some dreadlocks yeah. and get their yeah. hair caught or and shirts. then lose half of their face. Well, there have been other sort of accidents where you've got pulleys, V-belts, um, getting fingers caught in V-belts as they rotate, mm. shorts caught in V-belts. Mm. Now, one farmer that got his genitals caught in one, and that was be very painful. If you haven't got a cover on and something jammed and you're pulling on this, and all of a sudden it goes, your fingers go clean through there, and around they go, and off they come. So that's why you have a cover on it. Sounds like the voice of bitter experience. Yeah, well, I haven't got caught. A bloke in town got too close with his shorts and... They... He's the man that he got bit. So tell me, Peter, do you get any like safety training with, uh, with your machinery, um, when, either when you purchase it or, say, from your, your dad or your brother or uh, whoever, not... whoever passes the farming on to? It's sort of all handed down, I guess. It's just experience. Um, you learn to know where the dangerous things are, bits that bite. Mm -hmm. um, they've got warnings on most new machinery and covers. Um, there's covers on everything nowadays. Mm -hmm. It was the older machinery that's more dangerous. Stuff nowadays is fairly safe. I was just about to ask you about this case behind us, which is a pretty um, impressive piece of uh, tractor. Um, uh, the safety features in it, what, what are the safety features in it that impress you? Well, the seat on it won't let you jump off when you're going. Same with the harvester. If you try to get off with it moving, it shuts it down. Um, so you can't actually get off a moving bit of equipment. No. Um, a lot of farmers like to jump off and have a look at things while they're going. Well, no. it just goes into neutral. Same with the harvest, it does the same thing. Shuts the machine down if you jump off the seat. So you've got to be in the seat to drive it. Much of these things are now GPS guided on auto steer. Yep. Um, what do you think of auto steer and are there problems with them? Um, auto steer is good, but 
it's just not enough to do. Um, drivers tend to go to sleep, pull down power lines. One farmer tore down an SEC pole, land on top of his tractor, shorted it out, cost him $30,000. But at least he didn't, <laughs> at least <laughs> he it right. didn't cost his life. Yeah. We're just debating how heavy this is going to be to lift. We've got to lift this off. It's all cast. Well, that no. weighs 200 being kilos. A, being, a, being a good safety conscious farmer, you'll probably use a block and tackle to lift that. Well, that's for the little tractors. The, two of you and some the little tractors for that. Hopefully. What, on your experience farming in your time here, um, and your sons are farming with you as well? Yes. What have been some of the injuries that you yourself have sustained or, or others working on your farm? Um, fingers. I've got a mangled finger that got crushed under a harvester. Still all there, but it doesn't look that pretty. It's been slightly rearranged. Rearranged, yes, and not as straight as it used to be. Another one had the end cut off in a lawnmower, but that's when I was a, um, not farming. But yeah, falling off high places, sheds, um, silos. Recently there was um, someone fell off a silo in the district. Mm. Yeah. What about first aid? Do the farmers today know first aid? Um, a lot do. Um, I'm an ambulance officer. Um, that helps. Yes, and my wife's a trainer, so she tries to get as many people to do first aid as possible. Mm. Um, but a lot of farms just haven't got the time or don't make the time to do first aid. But, um, yeah. Do you usually, have kits and bits and pieces um, or do you just always have, have to like improvise? kit in the ute or you improvise with a bit of string or a hat or pressure bandage or anything that's available really. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times you... And always your hands are filthy dirty. When I crushed my finger I just was covered in grease. And you think, well, that's not going to mend very well. but. They always seem to. I think one of the great things about first aid courses in country areas particularly is that people often share their experiences of, mm. you know, my brother lopped, lopped his hand off or lopped most of yeah. his hand off and we found that this worked really well and people go, aha, yeah. that could work where I am, yep. hoping that they yep. of course never have a lopped off hand to deal with, but still. This is always a potential hazard. PTO drive on this. Well nowadays the silo's a bit better but you never want to get in the silo while it's emptying. Mm -hmm. um, a mate of mine I went to school with when I was this high got, his father was filling up a truck and he was in the silo. He got dragged in and that was the end of it. He just got suffocated in the grain. Yep. They had to cut the silo open to get him out. But it's just, and we used to do it as kids too. Yep. Well, I did, shovel wheat out of my brother's mouth while Dad came and pulled him out. Same with him just playing in the top of the truck. Mm -hmm. and, and you uh, just get tipped in? No, we were just going down in the wheat and he in an open V bin. And uh, yeah, we just got sucked down too far. And mm -hmm. once you get going, you, there's no stopping. Outside of the, the injuries that, that can happen to you while you're working on machinery and paddocks and what have you, uh, what about general health issues? Farmers get crooked too. Yeah, general sort of health, I suppose. Any farmer is reluctant to go to the doctor, I suppose, and they just don't go there because they have to. Nowadays, with driving road trains and stuff, we've all got to have a medical. Um, there's a lot of road trains. Farmers have road trains now, so you've got to have a medical every three years. So you sit on top of your health a little bit there. Um, but yeah, f farms, I suppose, do stress a lot um, under pressure from financial problems I suppose so mental health I suppose is one thing that you sort of got to have a look at. The, the, the suicide rate is highest among farmers than it is pretty much most other yeah. occupations. What are farmers around this district doing to minimise that? Are farmers starting to finally talk to each other and to look for help when they do feel under pressure? Yeah we did have a meeting at the ski lake earlier this year and all the farmers got together and had a barbecue and a beer and just discuss sort of general health and how they're going and talking to neighbours. But really in the district, a lot of people play sport. But it's a place to sort of let things out and get away from the farm and away from the stress, I guess. There's the PTO that goes onto that tractor. Yeah. This goes round and round, and this is what people get caught in. But every bit of equipment's got its own danger area. 
things fly around around it up top a bit more. And underneath, and if you fell off your tractor and went through there, well, it wouldn't pick you up, I suppose, but it could hurt you. What about your family's health? What are some of the, uh, the shortcomings in the delivery of health care in this region that you would like to see addressed? Um, well, my son's got a young family. Um, also helped the younger, and we've lost our doctor to deliver babies. We've had all our, my siblings have had to go out of the district to have, um, have babies, and it's sort of hard on the, the girls that have to travel a long way, either to Perth or Narragin or, yeah, Perth or Narragin, really. Yeah. Is it possible that some people are simply not having children because of the difficulty that it creates? No. No? no. They're still going to have the kids? No, these are farmers. They'll still have kids. <laughs> They'll still breed. <laughs>
is the fact that so many people in the country do not wear seat belts. I just can't understand the reason for it. Is it a macho thing? Is it I'm just nipping down to the, you know, to wherever? Uh, and yet it is responsible for so many accidents. Henry, why? I, why I, that? I would say it's more of a conveniency. And um, yes, it is, is uh, stupidity, I guess, for not wearing a seatbelt, for sure, and, um, and illegal. But um, it's, yeah, more of a convenience. If you were just going a kilometre down the road, it's easy just to hop in and drive there. Again, we don't, a lot of people don't think of the consequences because nine times out of ten, there is none. But it's that one time out of ten but, where And it's on that one occasion that Peter will see a lot of carnage when it presents exactly. itself to the hospital. Do you, as a matter of course, or do GPs, as a matter of course, say to a patient, and of course you wear your seatbelt whenever you get into your vehicle? Uh, I don't know if I would do it during most consultations, but certainly uh, the discussion of um, the circumstances of an accident uh, usually get discussed when, when they've crashed their, their vehicle. You never think that there's going to be a kangaroo or a flock of the neighbour's sheep that have all decided to get out of the gate or another car coming in the other direction or a jolly wheat truck. I think the most regrettable thing is that people don't um, think about using these habits until they learn from personal experience the hard and way. they're shocked into actually That's right. using it and to using seat belts and helmets. Mm. And now Peter they say that uh, experience keeps a dear school where fools and no others will learn and I understand that uh, your particular messages of safe use of equipment comes from a bitter personal experience. Would you care to share it with us? Uh, yes, uh, it was a couple of years ago. I was using an angle grinder with a fine cutting wheel and uh, stupidly I wasn't wearing my gloves and uh, nor was I fully concentrating. So what should, how should you have been kitted out for this particular operation? Well, um, what I should have probably been wearing is uh, some uh, protective outer garments which are made of leather, they're non-flammable and they're very hard to cut and they've just got some poppers. Um, I should of course be using eye protection and uh, of course it gets a bit dirty but I can still see through it. I should be wearing my 35 decibel reducing ear defenders and I should be wearing adequate gloves and I'm kitted out for nearly everything. And because you weren't using your gloves, what in fact was the upshot of this particular incident? Well, I cut the inside of my wrist and um, it was a Saturday afternoon and because I'm the only doctor here, I had to take myself to the hospital and stitch myself up. So it was a classic case of physician heal thyself. Absolutely, yes. Without anaesthetic as well. <laughs> and uh, then sometime later I uh, required a little bit of plastic surgery to repair the dinged nerve. The upside of all of this of course, and there is a silver cloud behind every lining, is that this served as a salutary lesson to everybody in the district because they all know about it. Yes, and um, I've, I've told people that um, I am now an even greater expert on stupidity because I've got personal experience <laughs> of it, so I will not hold back in sharing my wisdom. Where do people learn about this sort of stuff otherwise? Or is it all, as Henry says, just bitter experience? Uh, these communities, uh, it's very hard to keep secrets. And if somebody has an accident, it doesn't take long for everyone else to know about it. And for a short period thereafter, uh, people's general awareness and attention to doing the right thing is probably better. But unfortunately, time moves on and people move on and memories move on. Well, on that subject, we caught up with FarmSafe WA to find out about other resources that are available to you as GPs or to farmers about farm safety. FarmSafe WA Alliance exists to, to take into agriculture the safety message. Uh, to, uh, we run, uh, run courses and instruction for, for farming families so that they can better manage their, their farm profitably and safely. My personal experience, I spent 40 years in agriculture. Uh, we found that um, presenting to, to hospitals uh, with agricultural in injuries was often quite um, uh, humorous in some instances and quite um, dangerous in others because the, the health professionals often didn't understand what we were doing there uh, and, and what, what had actually happened. Uh, I contacted leptospirosis um, and it took four years uh, to convince the, uh, the doctors, about four of them, I went through four of them before I came 
across one who would actually even uh, entertain the idea. Uh, and after doing the blood tests, it was proven that, that I'd actually had that, um, that disease uh, and I endured it for four years uh, because there was no resource for, the, for the, the GP at the time to understand that farmers do contract, um, contact uh, uh, disease from animals. And, and some of the, the accidents that can happen uh, that the, often the GP's got no concept of what the machine that caused it or the big animal that caused it even looks like. And it's very hard to treat a person if you don't understand how they first con contracted the disease or actually how the accident happened. And we're talking about crushing accidents, um, finger lopping accidents with grain augers and these sorts of things that happen because uh, agriculture is such a diverse industry you can do seven or eight tasks in, in the morning where a lot of industry, the, the employee or the manager is doing the same thing for hours on end. In our industry, you could do four or five different tasks within the, in the morning. So we've put together a rural a, a rule general practice kit that each, we believe every GP in Western Australia should have, especially in rural Western Australia, that they can refer to when and I think they should read it as a resource and, re and refer to it when they, th when they don't understand what's been presented to them. There's descriptions of the machinery and the accidents we might have uh, and that sort of thing so that when, when one of my colleagues presents, they can say, I think this guy got trod on by a, a stud bull. When you realise that the bull or the animal may weigh up to a ton in weight, the crushing ability of that animal can make a horrible mess to a human being. And when the person presents it, they've been trod on by an animal and they think they're going to bandage up a foot and what they really have to do, it might be major surgery to, to rectify what's happened. It might mean an airlift by the St John Ambulance to a major hospital uh, where they're thinking they're going to bandage it up and give them a couple of painkillers and send them home. There's a checklist in this kit it gives them some suggestions of what this person might be exposed to, what their lifestyle might be like, and what might be happening to them in their environment. It points out that there is the opportunity to have um, life-threatening injuries by just driving around the farm. Uh, the farms are now very big and they often have built up roads and, and we travel quite quickly. Uh, there's the, the, as we talk about mental illness, where the, the final outcome could be an attempted suicide. Um, Farmers are, uh, are notorious uh, for having uh, uh, cardiovascular issues. Uh, heart attacks are not uncommon. Uh, and if they understand that the, the farmers quite often don't look after themselves like they should, that the pain in the chest might well be uh, a, a heart issue. Um, skin cancer, a grape on the, on the rise in, in rural Australia. A lot of us older guys don't wear sunscreen, didn't wear sunscreen uh, until it's too late. Um, then there's the, the, there's the man issue with prostate cancer. More agricultural men die of prostate cancer than city people, city men. Um, and it goes on through the, the, the cancers that they might have because of the lifestyle that they lead. Um, the risk of uh, grain dust, uh, chemical dust, uh, and what that will do. Uh, the allergies or, or what, it, what it affects, and we've just picked up that some chemicals now can actually affect your hearing. Um, there's a, we've talked about the zootic diseases, and there's four or five of those. A couple of them can be quite fatal. Uh, Q fever and brucellosis are probably the two most dangerous. Um, and, the, and the old chestnut of um, the farmers likely to be deaf. Uh, when, you, when they confront, when they uh, present to a doctor, the first thing you might have to do is make sure that he, he or she hears what you're saying to them. This resource that, that we have put together is available from the FarmSafe office. We have, uh, FarmSafe has uh, tried to uh, um, put them into GP practices anywhere that we think that they were welcome, but we would welcome any GP, especially the younger uh, starting out trainees and those going into a country practice for the first time, we would be delighted to send them one, two or three kits, whatever's required. All they need to do is contact the FarmSafe office, uh, which is in Forestfield, and, and we're available on 93594118, uh, and we welcome uh, those calls.
We have another resource uh, that's available that could be uh, uh, dispensed from uh, GP uh, surgery, especially when the, the patient who is an older person. Uh, and what this is is a, is a, a, a resource we put together to help, to help older farmers deal with farming. And, th and that resource is about how to keep on farming into their older age without uh, further damaging themselves. And it's things like easy lifting, uh, ideas about how to get onto their tractors, but, but often this could be uh, dispensed when a doctor treats a patient for uh, some sort of a, an injury that's caused by being a little bit older and not being that clever about how they're doing it. And this resource gives a, a farmer uh, dozens of ideas a farmer, whether it be male or female, dozens of ideas how they can go about farming into their older, uh, late, older age, if you like, and still enjoy it and not injure themselves any further than they have already. FarmSafe believes it's, it's, a, it's very important that the uh, rural GPs engage with agriculture and the people who are, pa are part of the workforce. Uh, I believe that a bad experience with a, with a doctor quite often scares especially uh, rural men away, they, they don't go back, but we believe that in partnership we can make that first um, consultation uh, a lot more comfortable for both the, the patient and the doctor, and if we can uh, help the, the GP with information that will make, that, that allows them to feel more comfortable with uh, some of their uh, um, agricultural patients, well, that's what we're setting out to do. So, Peter and Henry, do you have any final comments for uh, doctors who are treating farmers on a daily basis? I think it's very important when you're establishing yourself out here in a rural community that you've got to really cultivate your relationships. Doctors often don't come from the country originally, so before they can impose their ideas on how things should be done, they should stop and think and perhaps walk a mile in the shoes of the farmer to try and get into the mindset of, of, of what it's like to be doing the job out here. Once they've done that, I'm sure it's crucial that they actually try and encourage the farmer to build a trusting and friendly rapport with them, to encourage them to maintain the relationship and to keep coming back. So it's very important to try and build this, this trust which will hopefully last many, many years. Just reinforcing uh, what uh, Peter said, I think it's more uh, whereas the GP should um, aim at a understanding of, of the life as a, um, as a farmer so that they can really evoke that empathy and that the farmers can see it as like a truthful as opposed to a false pretense. And so I think from that will stem a, a more healthy relationship and, um, and more better results in practice. Well, Henry, good luck to you and in, uh, in your practice when you do you. graduate. And Peter, thanks for sharing your time with us uh, today. Well, that's it from the program brought to you this month from Narambeen in the Wheat Belt. We do hope it's been of interest to you, and we hope that you now have a better understanding of why those injuries that you see coming through your surgery happen the way they do. We're back next month on the 7th of June with everything to do with the stomach. We'll have a gastroenterologist and a general surgeon on board to answer your questions. If you'd like to review this program or any of our programs going back to 2008, you can do so by visiting us on the web, www.ruralhealthwest.com.au. From myself, Jerry Gannon, Dr. Olga Ward, and all involved in this program on location, thanks for joining us. See you next month.